Hi folks, Rudy Green here. Today I want to do a video talking about comparing the stories that Forrest published in The Thrill of the Chase with their earlier versions that he had published um, in the Montana newspaper a couple of years earlier. Now many of you are already aware of these stories. Uh, people have compared them over the years back when The Chase was active. But I think they're, I think they're worth revisiting again because Jack has hinted specifically that the changes in these stories might hold, you know, that secret sauce that we need to do to unlock where the treasure is found. And even if you don't believe Jack's the finder, that's kind of irrelevant because uh, we pretty much all seem to agree. You let me know if you feel the same way, but we all as searchers seem to agree that the thrill of the chase was probably essential to finding the chest. It seems to be that way. And even though Forrest has said over the years that uh, the poem is all you need, the poem has always been packaged in the context of having it paired with the Thrill of the Chase book. And so at the very least, uh, there seems to be the context provided by the book that will help us solve the poem. Uh, I think Forrest referred to this kind of as the big picture. Uh, Jack seems to use the word context more frequently, but I think both of those are, are describing the th same thing, which is understanding the framework that we need to interpret the poem using. So uh, I want to jump into these stories, and what I've done is I've taken my copy of the, my digital copy of The Thrill of the Chase and compared them with the digital text of the stories as they were published in 2008. And what the hypothesis is here, at least for me, is to see if we can find out or see if we can observe things that Forrest has altered or changed in these stories to add maybe one of the subtle hints that he was referring to. Because we know that Forrest didn't finalize everything right until the very end before this book was published. So he's probably still tweaking the poem and certainly fleshing out the stories and adding those subtle hints uh, that will help us solve the poem. Now, uh, before I get into those stories, uh, I just want to address one of the criticisms of this methodology, which is there was a statement that Forrest made asking about the relationship with the poem and the book. You all will remember it. You can look up the exact phrasing. Uh, but what Forrest said is he said that the hints in the book were not intentionally placed to aid the seeker. I think that's pretty close to the exact words that he used. And a lot of people interpreted that to mean that the hints were just sort of accidental or they were part of the story as they existed. And my, I, I used to think that way as well, but my thinking has drifted on that now to the emphasis being on to aid the seeker, not the um, not intentionally placed line. So when Forrest said, you know, Forrest was, was saying, if he was just saying the hints were not placed to or intentionally placed, that would be a more specific, broader meaning than those hints were not placed to aid the seeker. Uh, and I think it's more in line with his, his constant reinforcement of the idea that these were subtle hints that would only uh, bubble up to the surface maybe if you read the poem, read the book, read the poem, read the book, and started to adjust and align your thinking so that you saw the the, the hints for what they were. So in any case, uh, what I'm trying to do obviously is work on what is going to give us the most results in terms of solving the poem. I don't think Jack's ever going to tell us or confirm the result, but that doesn't seem to be important. I think we can actually solve it. So that's where I'm, I'm starting from. And I'm working on a few different things. Uh, if you saw my last video, I talked about my capitalization project. I'm documenting every single point in the poem or in the book, The Thrill of the Chase, where a word is capitalized and you know what type of word that is, what its meaning is, what the context is, whether it's capitalized in correctly or not. So I'm building this giant spreadsheet and going to look for if there's anything that could sort of be judged as intentional as for us giving a clue here as to what we're looking for to fill the role of Brown and why that would be a capital Brown in Forrest's puzzle. So anyways, um, I'm going to jump in. I don't know how many of these I'll get through. We'll just see how much energy I have right now. Uh, the first story that we're going to address is one that you all know as the Totem Cafe Caper, 
This appears in The Thrill of the Chase. Pull my book aside here so we have that. Uh, it starts on page 47. And this one was originally published in the uh, Montana newspaper. And the title of it at the time was Boyhood Memories of West Yellowstone Long Ago. So that's kind of just a generic you know, title that the newspaper gave to the story. Whereas in the book, Forrest captions it with a title that is more um, fairy tale like, you know, the Totem Cafe Caper gives a gives a location and a subject matter and, and sort of infers that this will be a a playful, uh, you know, gotten away with it kind of story. Now, I'm not going to read through the entire document and comment on every single change because a lot of these changes were probably just made to flesh out the story and, and make it longer and give it more interesting details to sort of move it from that category as being an antidote versus a story with a beginning, a middle, and end. And in the newspaper, it kind of appears more as an antidote. You can go look up the original story on there and, and compare them for yourselves. Um, I've also posted, by the way, the PDFs that I use in this um, in this video that I made to compare the stories on Thor, the Hint of Riches uh, forum. They didn't get a whole lot of attention on there, but no matter, uh, the research out there, if this is something you're interested in looking at or researching or trying to draw similar parallels to what I am doing. So um, with that in mind, let's jump right in. I'm gonna bring it up here beside me so that you can see the text. Uh, but as I said, you can go on Thor. These are also listed under threads, uh, starting with the line comparing stories. And uh, I'll post a link to them in the description as well, just so you'll have those easily accessible. So uh, I'm going to read it from my book just because it's easier. Actually, no, I have to compare them. <laughs> I have to look at this smaller text on the screen. All right. So the beginning of the story, he alters some of the structures here and changes tenses, swaps the word sped with bounced. Um, he adds this line, I used to hide behind a tree and laugh. So he's, he's smiling or in a happy state behind a tree. Uh, again, what I'm looking for here is I wanna look for items that Forrest subtly changed the story seemingly in a way to tell us something useful. So these are not just going to be editing changes or little details. I'm looking for something that, you know, feels a little more significant than that. And of course, I've read through these already. So I have kind of in the back of my mind what my own opinions are. But um, I'm just going to freestyle it and see what hits me. Um, so the, let me give you an overview of what the story has in case you haven't read it. See, so it'll make more sense as we go through. The story tells of Forrest's two different jobs up in West Yellowstone. The first one being selling newspapers and the second one being a dishwasher at the Totem Cafe. And there's, there's some parallels between both of these stories uh, that are kind of similar. Other people have pointed those out before. I won't take credit for them. Uh, they both start with water <laughs> or utilize water in some way. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to compare those as we get to it. So he, he adds a little more detail about him. Let me see here. All right. So the first one is uh, that I had in my notes here to, to cover. In the original version of the story, he refers to his um, container that he's using to hold the newspaper as the bag. He says, although the bag my 80 pound body had to carry was so heavy, I struggled with every step. And then in the thrill of the chase, he calls it the sack. And this is an interesting change only because when we get to his boss rolling up and yelling the, the line, you're canned, you're canned is a parallel line to the idea of being sacked. And so there's, there's, there's some wordplay that can be connected there that's probably, uh, possibly intentional. I don't know. So the, so the first one there that I think might be potentially helping us with the clues is the, the idea of these idioms. And, um, you know, we're changing the word bag to sacked here. He's also tired and has to sit down and rest on the curb, but it's for just a moment. 
Uh, where's the idea of sitting down and rest for just a moment uh, parallel to? Would you say um, Terry Scant, perhaps? Forrest adds a little more description of his boss's uh, ride uh, and describes it as a big, beautiful yellow Cadillac. Uh, when, of course, before there was no detail about the ride, so a bunch of, bunch of adjectives added to the ride. And then he yells out the line, you're canned, um, which, as I already noted, uh, kind of sounds like you're sacked <laughs> or would have the same meaning as you're sacked. And in the original version of the story, this is the first really significant change that I think is interesting. In the original version of the story, Forrest says, I didn't know what canned meant, but guessed it must be something good because I was so proud of my job. So we have a scenario where a young character, Forrest in this case, doesn't understand something that's been said to him or told to him, uh, the, the line you're canned in this case, uh, but he tries to judge what the meaning was. Um, and he says, that's because I'm proud of my job, which doesn't really make any sense, at least not to me. So I, I'm not sure exactly what Forrest was trying to communicate in the original version of the story. However, in the thrill of the chase, that line is changed to something uh, I would argue is entirely different. He changes it to because he, the boss, was such a nice guy. So as I was getting into, what the example here is showing is that we have a word or phrase that we don't know what it means. And the default unlearned position here is to judge it in the context of the boss being a nice guy, because that was Forrest's belief about the boss. But his belief wasn't correct, as, as we see. His mother follows up and tells him he's been fired, which is the, the actual meaning of canned or sacked. <laughs> and uh, Forrest, of course, is devastated. Uh, he goes into more detail in the Thrill of the Chase version of the story. He says, I just stood there while the sun went behind a cloud uh, and we're going to see the idea of being presented here and reinforced a second time later on. But the idea that I see there is that he is in the shade. You know, the sun's behind a cloud. It's now, he's now in the shade. Uh, the other sort of subtle idea there is depression. Not, not like in a clinical sense, but, uh, you know, sort of that childhood, you know, down in the dumps, depression. But depression also meaning, where we heard that word before, it's a geographic feature. And one that Jack, if you believe his story, uh, maybe Forrest is used as well, too. Uh, you can fact check me on that. But I, I know the word depression has been used um, to describe the, the final resting spot of the chest. So, and we see that idea being expressed here. You know, Forrest says he was devastated. I stood there while the sun went behind a cloud. It killed me for sure. Uh, and then he has a revelation. He has the aha moment, that moment that we're all looking for. All of a sudden, I saw, now remember, up until this point, the boss was a nice guy. That was his descriptor of the boss. A nice guy who drives a big, beautiful yellow Cadillac. And now, Forrest's um, context of the boss has changed now that he has experienced it in a different setting. He's been fired by this person. I saw my stupid ex-boss for what he really was, a fat, bald-headed hulk of a dirty name. So this is a complete reversal of what Forrest's original impression was, you know, sort of the innocent impression of the boss, that he was a, he was a nice guy. Um, I don't know if that was an overcorrection, uh, but uh, that's how Forrest perceived it. So, and, and the poem seems to need to be interpreted relative to Forrest. Horst Kazan says, I think his brain must have been constructed by the lowest bidder. Uh, I don't see an obvious hint there other than that he's uh, using a, you know, construction analogy to refer to, you know, intellect, which he's made some, uh, Forrest has made a several, especially when we look in the, uh, the Biddy story, he makes, uh, makes a couple of different references to intellect it, with some creative insults. Maybe that was something he was good at. Uh, and then if we didn't get the idea of depression out of this already, it reinforces again. I also felt like I'd fallen back to a place where there was no more back to fall back to. So 12-year-old Forrest here just has this existential crisis over getting fired. Uh, probably thinks it was unfair. I was just sitting down to rest. I was tired. I had this heavy load. 
and his mom comforts him. She said, it was all right to cry, so we did that while standing under the lean-to where my father kept the Plymouth. And we see another example of being in the shadow of something. You know, he was in the shadow of the cloud, now he's in the shadow of the lean-to. Um, I don't know what that might be hinting to, but uh, that's just what I see. So now the story shifts to his second new job, which in the original version of the text, Forrest describes as a dream job. Uh, in The Thrill of the Chase, he describes it as a big deal. It was on the best, uh, in the best part of town. Uh, he had to get up early. And he adds this detail, what is probably a rather significant detail and has been analyzed before, talking about the giant kettles used for making brown gravy. And of course, Forrest, you know, having the story published in the book, knows that the word brown in this context is going to be uh, significantly analyzed. Part of my capitalization project, which I, I'm, I'm going to do in another video, I don't want to get into so much here. I'm also looking for things that should have been capitalized, but weren't, or could have been capitalized, but weren't. And that's a lot more tricky because they don't stand out. Uh, but I, I may have some more details on that here. Obviously, brown isn't capitalized here. I don't think brown gravy has anything to do with uh, whatever the home of brown is. But uh, the, the fact that it's not capitalized may be telling us or presenting a pattern of why, of what kind of words uh, should be looked at as hints or not. All right. And my hypothesis, of course, um, just in case you're curious, is that Brown is a nickname for something because that is a predominant reasoning that Forrest uses to capitalize things throughout the stories in his book. Uh, you're going to even see some here as we continue on with this story. So um, in the original version of the story, we have a new character coming in here called Miss Mary. Forrest renames her in the thrill of the chase to Grandma. She makes cherry and apple pies uh, in both stories, and that sort of conveys the, uh, the visual imagery of the color red, uh, even though apple pies wouldn't be actually red. We think of apples as red. Kids would think of them that way too. But that's not a change between those stories. I'm just pointing it out. As I said, I'll post a link to these documents if you want to look at them for yourself and uh, see if you can extract any insights out of them. Now, the next part of the story he changes is he adds that it is a hot pie. And the contrast between hot and cold is told in multiple of Forrest's stories. And uh, I'm not going to go into that here either, but uh, it seems to be obviously related to how we would come up with a meaning for the word warm. He adds the, the word tiptoed. Uh, a lot of people have shoe, feet, and toe related uh, references in their solves. So just interesting that he added that word there. Also kind of makes it feel more like a caper. You know, in the original version of the story, Forrest is, uh, I don't know, perhaps not very, um, uh, he's not very clear on whether he actually you know, stole the pie or not. Um, anyways, uh, now he changes the name of the boss to Frosty. I think there's a version of this story too, and you can check me on this, but I think there's a version of the story too where Frosty is referred to as Fred. That's just something that I'm remembering from a few, few years back. I could be wrong. But in the story where he was a newspaper uh, sales boy, the boss is just named the boss. So he gives it a generic name. But in the second version of the story, he adds the nickname of Frosty. And the Frosty nickname tells us something about who Frosty is. Because Frosty, uh, Forrest describes, uh, adding down there below, almost immediately after naming him Frosty as full of homage. And that word uh, kind of invokes the idea of pride. Um, in fact, you know what? Let me just pop up the description of it real quick just to make sure that I'm... Uh,
doing that correctly. Um, respect shown publicly, it's actually a noun. Uh, so he was pretty full of respect for his own person and everyone around there knew it. So, so Frosty was kind of full of himself, uh, but not comfortable with the, the, you know, rest of the staff. It doesn't seem like they had respect for him. And then the forest describes grandma, which is grandma's kind of a nickname too. That's something that I noted in my capitalization project, which is still unfinished, but grandma took me out in the frozen meat locker. We're adding something else cold. Frosty's always associated with something cold and said that when the owner gave Frosty an inch, he thought he'd become a ruler, which is a little play of an idiom, you know, give someone an inch and they'll take a mile. And then Forrest switches the nickname. Uh, Grandma gives her excuse and Forrest gives his excuse. And then we see here that the nickname he now refers to the same person, Frosty, as the ruler. So we have an example here of the same word being used twice. One is a lowercase r, you know, for, for being a non-specific. But now we understand that the word ruler is referring to the same character we had previously nicknamed Frosty, who is the boss. So we see the addition of this justification for capitalizing a letter that wouldn't necessarily be capitalized because ruler by itself wouldn't be uh, capitalized. Um, the ruler thought both excuses were pretty lame. He fired me right there in the dessert section of the cafe. Uh, the, the, the ruler or Frosty's explanation is that he had stolen the pie or his justification for, for firing him was that he was stolen the pie. And we have a second case here where there is a misunderstanding of a word or a phrase in this case. And that phrase is dock my pay, which is what the ruler said. And the second part of this that's interesting is we have the word clue added. You see right here by my mouse pointer. I didn't have a clue about what that meant, but I noticed that no one was clapping. And this parallels almost exactly what you see in the first half of the story, which was we interpreted, let me scroll back up there to just kind of jog my memory. Um, we interpreted the word canned as good because, you know, the big yellow Cadillac was such a nice guy. But then when we learned the actual meaning of it, the context became clear. In this section here, almost the reverse has happened where a phrase doesn't have any meaning, but instead of jumping to a conclusion and uh, interpreting it in a specific way, the, the speaker adds, I noticed that no one was clapping. So nobody clapping gave us the context of whether this was good or bad. And obviously nobody was celebrating, so this is bad. Uh, and then we see the camaraderie of the rest of the restaurant employees. Um, and this uh, further exposition into Frosty's uh, personal life, that's been discussed a lot. I don't really have anything to add to it. And I'm not sure that that's a hint. Uh, and then he changes the word to caper in here. And the word caper is actually used elsewhere, uh, I think by Forrest as well, but to, to refer to the Philadelphia incident. So that's a, that's a kind of connecting word. And uh, the last sentence, of course, includes both capitalized nicknames, Grandma and Frosty's Day Off. So... That's what I have uh, with that document. And I'm going to go ahead and post this as is. And I think what I'm gonna do is just break up the rest of the segments by each of the stories, uh, because otherwise I'll kind of lose energy going into my explanations of them. And I want to uh, be able to be as useful as possible. So if you have any uh, comments or ideas about what's been talked about, feel free to add that to the comments below. 
and I will post more uh, later. Thanks.